Since it launched in September, the Inspire 3 has quickly become my favorite day-to-day -day activity tracker. Simply because of the battery life, the size, the shape, the comfort, and just the ease of use of it. It's taken some of the features of the Charge and the Lux, which have been out for a little while now, and it's just put it into a much slimmer and sleeker package overall. The way I'm gonna boil this review down is into two halves. The first half will be a little bit of a comparison to some of the other Fitbit ecosystem products. So like the Charge and the Lux and the Inspire 2 that came before it. The second half I'll go a little bit more in depth into my long-term ownership of the device. If you are interested in some of the other Fitbit products, uh, I've done videos in the past. The last video I did, I'll link up here. It compares the Charge 5, the Lux, and the Inspire 2. So if you want a little bit more in-depth detail of those other two, I'd recommend checking that out. The first thing you should really know about the Inspire 3 is it's a more bare bones tracker. It does have some newer features like the SPO2 that they've added, but in general, with a small screen that's 0.76 inches, it's really not good for like reading your notifications. If you want something more along that line, then the Charge 5, the Sense, the Versa, or even a dedicated like Garmin, Android watch, or an Apple watch are just better for inputting notifications. I only really have calls activated on here, so I'm not like reading small messages on here. I'm more just getting phone calls when someone calls me because that's something that I want to see. I'm not going to go into a rant about the charger again, but they did end up changing the actual charger mechanism for it. It used to be a magnetic one, and now it's a kind of clip system that you latch onto. So Fitbit's kind of been bad about this just because you know, if you upgrade over time, you could have multiple chargers that you could throw in different bags. But with this, the downside is that it doesn't interface with the Lux and the Charge 5 charger, which they had finally made the same magnetic kind of docking system. But the plus side is it has a 10 day battery life, so you really don't need to charge it very often. The Lux doesn't really offer any upgrades in terms of kind of internal features from the Inspire 3. You can even see on the product comparison page that there's nothing really different between the two. It's more just the physical case of it. So the Lux is a kind of premium metal design. So if you want to like dress up with this thing more, then maybe that's a good option. But in my opinion, it's really not worth it now that they have the same internals because it has a four day to five day battery life. So really not great when you look at it overall. The Charge 5 is a little bit more advanced just in terms of the features. It has standalone GPS. So if you're someone that likes to go on a run without your phone, it's just good for that. I personally always have my phone tethered because I wanna have like music playing or something, which the Charge 5 doesn't have offline music. So if the GPS feature is really necessary for you, then the Charge 5 would be the one you should get or the Sensor Versa. The Charge 5 also has an ECG sensor. This only has the, you know, it does your heart rate, but it also has SpO2, so your blood oxygenation. If you're looking at these devices for like the SpO2, the EKG, the ECG, you really shouldn't be using them as a medical device. These are just good for like the variability of your heart rate. And they're kind of just more like baseline features. I wouldn't use them as a medical device because the wrist is really not the best place for that. Your fingertip is way better. So it really depends when you're watching this video, but the Inspire 3 you can find sometimes as low as like 75. The Lux, you can get a little bit over 100 if it's on sale, and the Charge 5, you can kind of get in the 120, 130 range if it's on sale. So look out for like Black Friday, the Prime Days, these tend to go on sale pretty often. Depending on the time frame you're watching it, just uh, keep track. I'll put the links to all these in the description below the like button there, so you can check it out for yourself if you want to stay updated on those prices. Anyways, it's getting super cold up here, and there's kind of some cops around here, I'm sure you can hear. So we'll see you back inside for the second half of this review. Some of the changes to the Inspire 3 include the fact that they added an ambient light sensor which just makes it more usable in the daytime. It'll adapt to the brightness of your environment or when you're wearing it in bed at night, it's not gonna blind you if you accidentally move it or if you wanna check the time in the middle of the night. 
It's gotten ever so slightly thinner than the Inspire 2. That will really help if you kind of wear it under a sleeve of some sort and it just makes it a little bit sleeker in general. The screen is marginally bigger at 0.04 inches bigger than the Inspire 2. But what has happened is the resolution has significantly increased. It's actually just over quintupled. So the kind of dot matrix you could see on the Inspire 2 is no longer visible. If you look very closely to this, you won't even be able to distinguish the individual pixels. That's how dense the PPI is on it, or the pixels per inch. Another thing they changed is the SpO2 sensor in the back. That is your blood oxygenation. It is a feature that they brought down from the charge and from the Lux as well. This feature really shouldn't be used as a medical feature, but it's just a nice addition that Fitbit has included and is a good kind of baseline or a guideline for things like your blood oxygenation. It can also do heart rate variability now. So if you have a really low or high heart rate compared to your normal resting rate or your kind of normal active rate, some good news if you're a user of the Inspire 2 or one of the Inspires previously is that a lot of the accessories, um, the straps will still fit. Mind you, they might have a small different way of interfacing because the shapes of the actual devices have changed, but I have tried intermixing a lot of them and they all seem to fit some tighter than others, but that is good if you already have you know, a lot of those or if you would like to upgrade your accessory straps. The only other accessory that I'd really recommend that you like should definitely have is a screen protector. I wore this about one month without a screen protector to kind of test if the scratch resistance was a little better. And I have to say that it is better than the Inspire 2 for sure. But I'd still recommend a screen protector. This is something that you wear on your wrist and it's really easy to kind of bang around and get dinged. I'll put down in the description some of my favorite screen protectors that I've used for this. The only other accessory that I think you might be interested in is if you don't like wearing this on your wrist, let's say when you're playing sport or you just would like it somewhere else, they do have little clip accessories that you can attach to your sock, your waist, uh, wherever. I'll put one of those in the description as well. The interface of the scrolling and the side scrolling has changed a little bit. It's a good upgrade, I think. It follows the charge lineup and the Lux lineup as well in terms of just the overall UI. One thing I'm really happy to see is that the device now supports inbuilt alarm setting. Now this may seem like something that is pretty trivial, but you used to have to go into your phone to set an alarm so that you could have a silent alarm on your Fitbit. Now, the silent alarms are really useful if you don't wanna disturb people around you or if you just want a subtle reminder that like, I don't know, your oven's going off or uh, you finished cooking something. It's just nice to be able to set that within the device, something the Inspire 2 was not able to do. You had to go in the app for that. There's also the silent alarm feature, which is pretty cool. It kind of looks at a 30 minute window before you set your alarm and it'll wake you up when you're in your lightest sleep, potentially making waking up a more pleasant experience or make it so that you're a little less groggy when you wake up. This is something I've used and I have to say it works decently well. There are kind of three things going on in the Fitbit ecosystem that I thought were pretty relevant to mention. I'll first mention the two negative ones and then I'll end on a positive. So the first one is the challenges slash community section of the Fitbit app. Now, speaking about communities, a big part of any company's product strategy is community, and especially more so when it comes to fitness. Fitbit has announced that they're sunsetting the communities slash challenges within the Fitbit app. All right, this is editing Vlad from the future. I made a little mistake in that last section so every time I talk about challenges and communities, it should be challenges and adventures. So replace communities with adventures for what I'm about to say. Now, if you're not familiar with this, it's kind of like a social aspect where you can add like friends and family and you can follow each other's you know, fitness endeavors. It kind of gamified the whole experience, which sometimes can actually be a really good thing. 
for example, when I use Duolingo, it's very gamified now, and that draws me back. Like when I first used it in 2000, whatever, 12, 13, I don't know, it was uh, just very basic and I like didn't really end up using it much. And now that it's gamified, there's like rewards and there's things that you can unlock and, you know, so it keeps the users coming back. And I think this is like a really big downside uh, that has kind of sparked some outrage in the Fitbit community on forums and whatnot from what I've read. I've been an Android user for 10 to 15 years. So it's one of those things that like I've seen multiple services within the Google world that they just completely abandon ship after a while for seemingly no reason. I mean, maybe they're looking at the data and they just don't see it panning out in the long term or something like that. But it's just kind of sad to see that happen for something that is so core and central to the Fitbit ecosystem. Now, the second thing is that with, uh, and this one's kind of small and not super relevant, but they're forcing people to have a Google account versus a Fitbit account. So even if you already had a Fitbit account, you still need to make a Google account with it. Some people are upset about that, but I don't really think it's a big deal. And now the third one is actually on a more positive note, the 30 to 90 day data that you kind of accrue when you're wearing the Fitbit, whatever Fitbit that you have, and this is applicable to any of them, you actually used to have to pay for the service, right? So it was a Fitbit premium service that uh, some of these, like this one comes with six months. The Inspire 2, I think, came with a year. So actually, that's kind of a selling point of the Inspire 2, I'd say. comes with a one-year premium subscription. Now they give you the 30 to 90-day data, which is, in some senses, the most relevant data, right? That you would want to see if, uh, you're, I don't know, you're trying to lose weight or get more fit. Like, that is your most relevant data, like one to three months of the previous data. Still, you can't see like stuff a year back. You'd still need premium to do that. But as I've said before, I'm kind of against these premium like subscription services in general. There's just a lot of like in the Fitbit Google kind of merge, there seems to be a bit of turmoil in there. It's like almost like Fitbit's trying to compete with Google. So as an example of this, even in just the Fitbit realm, when the Sense 2 and the Versa 4 came out, Google actually kneecapped those products by removing the Google Assistant entirely from them. And then they removed sideloaded apps like Spotify, uh, Starbucks, stuff like that. It, so essentially, if you're a Versa 3 or a Sense user, by upgrading, you're actually kind of downgrading. It's a very weird move, like unless you were to get a Pixel Watch, which then you get all those features. So there seems to be some like tension going on between their own ecosystem, especially with the challenges feature. And the now to have a Fitbit, you need to have a Google account kind of thing. It's just a little strange. I think they need to kind of have a more cohesive vision for their, their ecosystem. The auto activity tracking is great. And if I go for a run, it'll track it perfectly. I've done videos in the past where it, uh, you know, I've measured like on my phone versus on my Fitbit the distance um, and how they compared to each other. And it was pretty similar. One thing I do set the activity tracking for is swimming. That's a little bit harder to auto detect, I think, just because the sensors get all messed up with water. I love the swimming feature because it adds your kind of lap counter and it gives you your stats when you're underwater, which is cool. Also, speaking of swimming with the device, I feel like sometimes when I get out of the pool and I'm looking at my device, it would be nice to, like it has a gyro in there, right? So when I flip up, it'd be nice if it told me sometimes like the lap count, that's something they could upgrade. It will seldomly tell you the actual time elapsed since you've been swimming. Most of the times it just tells you to double tap the screen to finish the activity, which is a little annoying. <laughs> I feel like when you lift it up, it should tell you like your stats and then you can continue or you can then go squeeze it or double tap it and then end it yourself. That's just a kind of repetitive thing that I'm not really into. I don't run very often, but I do play a lot of sports and the auto tracking for activities like that is good in the sense that it'll start like a cardio activity of some sort. It sometimes gets a little confused on what it is or it'll just log it as like cardio, but it's good at tracking that you're actually doing something. So if you want to go in and look at like 
stats of that activity, it's good, but to differentiate a lot of the sports, it's like super difficult, right? Because basketball versus soccer versus tennis, like how are you really gonna know the difference on auto activity tracking? That's pretty tough to do. For biking, I don't really recommend this because it links to your phone anyways. I like to use Strava because it's very accurate and that actually does have a community feature. So I can, you know, go on rides with friends and it'll merge our rides. Uh, I can see some of the social activity of my family and friends and I can go back and look at like all the, the data if I want and it's, it's just nice. So for biking, I recommend that. It's a free app and works super well. One thing Fitbit I think needs to figure out as a whole is daylight savings time and time zones. I've never accurately gone to a different time zone and have my Fitbit, doesn't matter which model, I've never had one of them auto update. You can tick in the app there, like set to phone's time zone, um, daylight savings, but without fail, I will always have to go in there and reset it and change kind of the time zone back and forth or like turn it on and off and then it'll finally fix itself. You know, I've been late to things before, like time zones where you're out one hour and this thing was kind of what I was judging my time off of. So now I know to always double check. So Fitbit, if you're listening, that's something that should just work. It's very simple. One thing I did notice with my Inspire 2 that I had for about a year and a half before I switched was that I would take it in the sauna maybe a couple times a week or once a week and um, the battery life did significantly deteriorate over time. So the heat kind of fluctuation is not good for the device and it's something I've just really never thought about in the past, but now I'm kind of proactive about taking it off and uh, you know putting it in my bag or something when I go in the sauna so that it's not gonna ruin the longevity of the battery because that 10 day mark that I was getting from the Inspire 2 turned to like a five to seven day mark at the end of a year and a half, which is a pretty significant deterioration, I'd say. Also, rest in peace to this chain that I'm wearing in here, but that is somewhere lost in between the wooden slats in the sauna now. Anyways, if you'd like to see more Fitbit content in the future, please stay subscribed for that. And if you'd like to see something currently, uh, I have a video that I did here on the Charge 5, the Lux, and the Inspire 2, which you can watch. So anyways, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.